very good to see a lot of people here um, to see the project. Um, I would like to thank the Connected Everything, first of all, to funding this project. It was really, very, very good. So this project is I am the PI and Ed Lester and Durenj Pekastan is a co-I in this project. So Durenj is from computer science and um, Ed in chemical engineering. So thanks to this project, we had two amazing postdocs who work in this project as part time. And so both of them uh, has recently finished the projects and we are finalizing the, the, the report. So I'm going to give you some information and some data. So why are we doing this project and what result we receive? Ooh, OK, second. Um, so. Yeah, so as an outline, so the, the, the main question when I started this project was, can machine learning really help us to develop to find the novel inorganic materials, mainly metal oxide, which is useful in my project in a continuous hydrothermal process? But before starting that one, I'm going to give you a brief idea of why we need these metal oxide and where I am planning to use these metal oxide and why it is important to use machine learning. So which is mainly focus area of biomass for net zero future. And so I'm going to give a brief explanation. How can we apply the machine learning to this process and how the results of what, what results we receive? So. <laughs> For the people who is not from engineering background, so probably you haven't seen this figure before, but this is 2,100 warming projections. This figure is actually showing what happening, what we are planning after 100 years, so currently is 2077 mm, years later. So what we are expecting as a temperature increase due to the global warming. So we have been targeting to reach 1.5 degrees Celsius to decrease our CO2 emissions, but unfortunately, Today projections is actually showing us in only seven years time in 2030, we have to decrease our CO2 emissions half of today's emissions, which seems is very, very unrealistic. So that's mean we actually lost the opportunity to reach 1.5 degrees Celsius. So the works are updated. So now we are actually focusing 1.8 to the deg two degrees Celsius increment. But to reach that level, we need to start doing a lot of CO2 capture as soon as possible. But how this CO2 is actually, how this carbon is coming, where it is coming. So this is a very simple explanation and I've been using every lectures I have. So if we are using fossil fuels for energy consumption, energy productions, we are positively contribute to CO2 emissions to the environment. So if we're using fossil fuels, but apply carbon capture storage on those technologies, we have less positive. So which means we are pretty OK to use these technologies. If we have renewable energy, that's great, like a natural or slightly positive contribution to CO2. And if you're using bioenergy, biomass, so it's pretty much, again, natural or slightly positive CO2 emissions. And another approach, which is bioenergy applying to carbon capture storage, where actually if you produce energy from bio-based fuel and then apply carbon capture storage in this technology, we are reaching negative CO2 emissions, which technically means we are extracting the CO2 from atmosphere thanks to the combusting the biomass and capture the CO2, remove the carbon from natural cycles. So bioenergy and biomass is actually recently recognized that uh, it's going to be play a very, very important role in the future's net zero technologies. So very briefly, what is carbon capture storage? So for carbon capture storage, when we are say CCS or carbon capture storage, we are talking about we have a source. You can assume this is a power plant or an industry that release carbon dioxide. What we're trying to do, we try to capture that CO2 with using a new technology, compress that CO2 purely and transport to the storage area. We are hoping that in the future we're planning to use these CO2s as well. So currently all the research are focused on how we are going to capture to CO2 because we have to develop new technologies to capture these, these CO2s. But the problem there, we have these technologies, high energy intensive, very, very expensive technologies and keep producing another waste, not CO2, but different type of solid waste. 
So my area of expertise is actually, OK, so instead of developing a technology to capture the CO2, why we are developing the new features technologies, combine the source and CO2 capture and produce a technology that inherently captures CO2 without the requirements of downstream CO2 capture process, where the chemical looping is coming quite attraction. So if you haven't heard before, so why, how we are producing the energy from biomass or any type of fuel. So we have air and we have fuel. This is hydrocarbon. We are mixing in a combustor. So air, the oxygen in the air, combusts the fuel and produce carbon dioxide. And nitrogen is coming from the air. And then a flue gas is produced carbon dioxide and nitrogen. And this process is produce our main energy. All the power plants is working with these principles. So what chemical looping is offering? So we have another fuel reactor, like a combustor. We have biomass as a fuel, but instead of air, we are combusting biofuel with metal oxides. So metal oxide, the oxygen in the metal oxide, combusts the fuel and produce pure CO2. So as we produce pure CO2, we don't need to capture CO2. It's already pure. We can compress and store it. But what happening, the reduced metal oxide, the metal is lose the oxygen. So we're sending it to another reactor, which is called a reactor. In the air reactor, metal oxide or reduced metal oxide is mixed with the air. The oxygen in the air transferred to the metals and then reoxidized back to the, their previous version. So following this reaction, we only release depleted air, mainly nitrogen concentrated air, which has no harm to the environment. So what is happening simply, we are splitting the combustion reaction into two independent reactors. So thanks to these and thanks to metals are able to carry the oxygen from air to the fuel. We don't need to capture this CO2 because it's already pure and then we can compress it. As we are using um, biomass or biofuel in this concept, the CO2 that we are capturing, it counts as a negative CO2 emissions. So in this process, the biggest, the most important part is the metal oxide and how we're going to use metal oxide because we have a lot of metal oxide like iron oxide, manganese oxide, cobalt oxide. We are actually using these metal oxide, our daily base um, activities. But how are we going to operate in this process and why it is important? Because Recently, the studies show that among five different, um, eight different carbon negative technologies, chemical looping showing the very, very promising cost in terms of the CO2 capture and CO2 avoidant. So, but then how can we predict and how can we capture this CO2 with this technology and what type of metal oxide we're going to utilize? So if you go to the literature, so you usually find that a lot of research is focusing on natural ores. It is actually embedded under the ground. They are suggesting that let's extract these ores and use these ores in this technology, which is very possible because it's very, very cheap materials. But these materials is highly ineffective and tends to produce a lot of inorganic waste to the environment. So my approach is why we are using natural ores. We are clean to CO2, but on the other side, we are producing inorganic waste that's going to be a big problem in the future if we're going to continue to use them. So what I have been focusing on, we are much smarter than, than just using the natural reserves and we can produce our new composite metal oxide with using chemical processes, which call advanced metal oxide nanocomposites. And I focus on how can we apply the machine learning to develop these materials. So this is the process we have here at University of Nottingham. It's a hydrothermal process. We are using water and metal precursors to produce metal oxide. It's very environmentally friendly and cost effective process. It's nearly auto energized. So the energy is produced itself. And within this process, we have an online um, analyzer at the end of the process the, this FDOR is an analysis analyze the products so we are planning to transfer we have been planning to transfer all these 
characterization data to a computer and develop the model, that model is going to check what materials we produce. Is this a good materials or a bad materials? And based on this result, it starts controlling the pressure of the system and what type of precursors we're going to feed to the system and also process um, con other process conditions, which is heating. So thanks to this autonomous control, so we are planning to, we, we, we were able to produce a wide range of metal oxide having higher oxygen carry capacity, control pore structure, better kinetic activity, composite metal oxide structure and better physical chemical characteristics. So these metal oxide are showing very, very highly promising results than the natural ores. So, but how we apply this one and why we actually really, really need this process. So if we are going to do this one without computer, what we normally do, we set a temperature in the process, um, a fix the temperature and test a wide range of pressure. This is a two variable optimization process, which usually a wide range of academics and industries using these techniques. So when we find the best temperature, then we fix the pressure uh, sorry, best pressure, we fix the pressure and we change the temperatures. And then we have a new great yield and another process conditions. So based on this temperature, we need to re-optimize the pressure again and then re-optimize the temperature again. This actually increased the workload and also the test number. It's quite a lot. And that's also uh, assuming that these uh, variables are dependent to each other. But we, also, we all know that the, all these variables, the process conditions, are independent from each other. So that's why we need to go at grid scanning. So grid scanning is required with, with computer and machine learning to understand what is the best optimized process conditions. To do that one, we just need to give three points to the computer, so which is best, next best, and worst. And based on these three conditions, the program is going to start testing and evaluate the impacts of each process conditions and find the optimum conditions in a very, very short time. That's going to help us to find optimum materials in a very, very short time. So this is only two parameters. If we have more parameters, like a 3D or four different conditions, in a manual version, it's going to make very, very complicated and nearly impossible to find optimized conditions, while for a computer based work, it's make it very easy and very short. So this is also the computers is really, really helping us in a different approach. So when we produce these materials, so we need to characterize them to understand what materials we produce. Unfortunately, existing material, some, some characterization techniques that we can directly embed it into the process. But on the other side, some other techniques that we are not able to process, optimize or, or run with the process we have due to the limitations. So what computers can do, they can predict the data that we need with using the existing analysis techniques. The first things that we have done in our projects that we had the FTIR data of the metal oxide, and then we tested that, is it possible to predict XRD analysis data? XRD is quite highly expensive and offline methods we have to do separately. And following a series of machine learning approach and developed a new approach that we, um, we embedded our models into the currently existing models, and then we were able to, and using some um, generic equations like Gaussian and Lorentzian, um, um, the, the, the graphs, and we were able to find the best method to predict the XRD, XRD with using FDR analysis. So as you can see here the, at the end, so after we tested the generic Gaussian and Lorentzian um, curves, so we, we optimize them and then we kind of um, um, change the limitations and we avoid fittings. So following these fittings, we were able to predict our first predicted XRD analysis. So following this one, we apply this in our FDAR data 
the first graph we get is this one. So this is, as you can see, it's quite like it's an XRD figure, but it's quite interdependent from each other. To update that one, we just slightly modify the equations and be able to produce our first XRD data with using FDR analysis. So this analysis will require a very expensive uh, equipment to complete the whole process. And other things, this analysis enable us to continuously analyze our product and immediately change the, the productions. So thanks to these developed programs, what we were able to do, so we were able to test a wide range of different metal oxide and produce at different conditions. And we were able to immediately understand what metal oxide we're producing under what conditions. As you can see here, they're predicting very well and very, very accurately reaching the copper oxide, cobalt and manganese oxide. Not only that one, when we start building a composite structure, which is, for example, mixing with copper oxide with aluminium oxide or cobalt or manganese oxide with aluminium oxide, we kind of start ending up very interesting and continuous patterns. So predicting the XRD analysis very well. Now also, as you can see here, even small chains, some of them we didn't understand what is this XRD. So we compare with the offline method. It's showing very similar patterns, but it's not even some figures is showing unknown peaks. This is even computer able to predict these unknown peaks, even if it didn't know in advance, there could be a problem on the peaks as well. And, and finally, this is the multiple version, like three different metal oxide composite predictions. So we predicted well, and, and we saw that in the subsections, as you can see here and here, the program was able to predict the OH bond. So it's kind of like even a small change in the, the, the conditions and process parameters the program was able to predict from FTIR analysis very well to XRD analysis and telling us what products it produced and decide the following conditions. So as this is the pictures is showing how these programs work well. So the red line that you are seeing here is showing the metal oxide, the computer is it's op op optimize the conditions of the process and produce the optimum copper oxide modified aluminium. So we already produced two different copper oxide modified aluminium by ourselves with using our optimized methods. And it's showing that the computers, the, mat the materials is produced by the, the, the program by the computer is showing much higher oxygen carry capacity, almost double than what we produce with our methods. So that's actually showing that computer can able to predict the results very well, and they are able to produce much advanced metal oxide than our own conventional methods. So what we are doing right now, so we have determined the optimal, optimal machine learning model for FDR analysis, but we are planning to try a wide range of different machine learning models to find a better uh, predictions and also validation of selected train FDIR analysis models against XRD with using a different methods like TEM, SEM, and XPS. So, so we're going to add an additional online analytical methods like UV or pH or, or colorimeters to get more characterization results online and continuously. That's going to enable us to produce advanced metal oxide much quicker and much faster. And also, um, we're going to correlate, correlate optimized FDR analysis and against the hydrothermal product, production parameters to find what is the commercial level of production of these metal oxide with using this method and this model. And as a next step, we're planning to go with um, four different metal supported by aluminium. So in total, it's going to be five metal oxide is going to be in the compositions. So this is a very brief visual feature works what we're planning to do. So we have any more FDIR and predicted XRD data for a wide range of different metal sites. So we already stored these like as a cloud. So we're planning to give us these inputs as a new inputs anymore. And with using different algorithms, we're planning to um, develop some new model, supervised or unsupervised models to predict the other algorithms, other, um, other characterization methods to make our process better and, and faster. Well, that was the whole presentation I have.